Good morning, and thank you, Catherine, for the kind introduction. And I'd really like to thank the organizers today for inviting me, and um, also to thank all of you. It's wonderful to see such a great big crowd on a chilly Sunday morning. So I hope everyone has had some um, opportunity to fuel up on the coffee and pastries at the back of the room. So. Taking the lead from my colleagues, um, Shandine and Emily, I too wish to introduce you to an exceptional collector and collection at the RISD Museum. So my talk today turns us to a figure that I am sure many of you might be familiar with. Was I right? Yes. <laughs> All right, so born in Providence in 1874, Abigail Green Aldrich was the fourth child of Senator Nelson Aldrich. As the daughter of a privileged and respected family in Rhode Island, Abby was introduced and exposed to art at an early age. Her father was one of the founders, actually, of the Providence Art Club. I heard that you had lunch there yesterday. Um, so this was a venue, as you all know, that frequently hosted art exhibitions and also speakers. So it's not surprising that art appreciation was integral, or was an integral part of Abby's youth. She embarked on her first extensive European tour in the year she turned 20, where she visited numerous art galleries, enriching her knowledge and discernment of art. Abby married John D. Rockefeller Jr. in 1901. And after that, she settled into life in New York. And in the years that followed, she became a mother of six and a key figure in society. She took many trips with her husband, both domestically and internationally, participating in philanthropic work and events. Today, Abby Rockefeller is still known for her philanthropy as well as her patronage and, many contrib and, and her many contributions to the art world. She is perhaps most well known for her contribution to MoMA, which she co-founded, and whose collection she helped to build and develop. Her collection of American folk art, located today in Virginia, is also known to many. Her collection of Japanese woodblock prints, however, is lesser known. This is the collection that she gave to the RISD Museum and the focus of my talk today. Abby started collecting Japanese print in 1916. Here are some of the first prints she bought, a group that were previously from the collection of Mrs. John Osgood Blanchard. They were auctioned at the American art galleries at the time, and the American art galleries are the predecessors of Sotheby's today. Prints were fairly inexpensive at the time, and with the modest inheritance Abby received after her father's death, she was able to purchase these works. Japanese prints were very popular, widely available at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm sure many here know the term Japonism. I see many nods. Um, and are familiar with the craze for Japanese things during the 19th and 20th centuries. European artists like Monet, Van Gogh, had large co print collections and were inspired by compositions in Japanese prints. American artists like John Lafarge, drew heavily on Japanese aesthetics as well. In fact, believe it or not, Lafarge collected Japanese prints and paintings as well, some of which also ended up in our collection. But that's a story for another day. Here, what I wanted to show you is how Lafarge referenced these woodblock prints. Right? You can the, the print on the left. So the print that you see here is one um, that Abby Rockefeller gave us in our collection, but Lafarge also had prints like that in his collection, and you can see how his painting draws from these compositions.
But for many of us, when we think about Japanese woodblock prints, we think of iconic works like this. Again, I see many nods. Um, this is The Great Wave, as you all know, by、um, Katsushika Hokusai. And besides landscapes like this, there were many different subjects and themes and genres in Japanese woodblock prints, including pictures of actors, warriors, beautiful women, and so forth. One subject that is depicted often in these Japanese prints, but often overlooked, is the subject of birds and flowers, what we know as, as kachoga. The majority of Abby's woodblock prints were within this genre. Now, what is kachoga? Although it literally means bird and flower pictures, the prints within this genre, as you can see, encompass more than just birds and flowers. You see from this picture that they included cats, insects, sometimes even fish. In some, they were prints that focus on the flora and fauna or the natural world. This genre has a long history and tradition beginning in China. Pictures of the natural world. Flourished in the Song Dynasty courts from the 10th to 13th centuries. The Song Emperor Huizhong, in fact, himself a painter and calligrapher, was a big enthusiast, and he had a huge collection of paintings devoted to this subject. Court painters produced many pictures in different formats that were hand scrolls, hanging scrolls, albums, and they painted on both silk and paper using ink sometimes. And also colorful pigments to accentuate the subjects. Many were paired with poetic inscriptions, imbuing them with a sense of lyricism and literary significance. You can see here on the left, this is a 17th century Chinese painting, also in our collection, and it depicts a pair of cranes perched on a snow laden branch. And it's a plum tree. You can see some of the pop, you can't see the plum blossoms very well, but they're all laden with snow. And this whole painting is painted against a moonlit night. See the moon in the corner? It's painted entirely in ink in a combination of expressive and meticulous brush strokes. The elegant composition evokes nostalgia, maybe a bit of melancholy. For the Chinese nobility and intellectuals at the time, the pairing of crane, plum, and moon would have added additional literary significance. Pictures and of birds and flowers made their way from the continent to Japan, where they were also adopted by court painters and painters of the shogunate there. The painting of cranes and plums here in the middle was painted by Kano Tansetsu. Who was a painter in attendance to the shogunate? The cranes are again meticulously delineated. Their feathers are brushed with white pigment, carefully colored with this mineral white pigment. Kano school painters often drew from Chinese paintings, like the ones that you see on the left, which they saw and consulted from the extensive shogunal collections. Besides paintings, printed books and materials on science and medicine, most of which contain detailed studies and illustrations of flora and fauna, also inspired Japanese painters. And they provided them with a wealth of resources. Parallel to paintings by court and shogunal painters, other painting modalities employing bird and flowers also emerged in this period. Now, when the print industry began thriving in the 17th century and gained popularity, Burton flowers were quick to be adopted into the repertoire. Designers were quick to emulate the different styles of Burton flower prints. 
paintings into print, and they develop unique approaches to the genre as well. The print here at the end, this is actually a print, not a painting, is by Hokusai, the same artist whom we just saw with the Great Wave. He also made many prints and paintings of Burton Flower. So you see that the print retains a painterly quality, despite the fact that it is a print. But as a result, a classical painting subject, accessible before only to the elite, has now become affordable and available to the masses as well, because prints were relatively inexpensive and widely circulated compared to paintings. Abby, too, was fascinated by Burton Flower pictures, although she never specifically mentioned why she focused on this one particular genre in Japanese print, we can guess that her accumulated collection of almost 700 prints in this genre was a result of her love for nature, combined with, of course, her appreciation for Japanese prints. Like many of her contemporaries, Abby decorated her surroundings um, with Asian art. She had learned to appreciate Asian art, as I said to many of you um, in the beginning, because she frequented talks at the Providence Art Club with her father to listen to lectures in Japanese and Asian art. So after she married John D. Rockefeller Jr., she and John collected Asian art together he prioritizing Chinese ceramics and antiquities while she focused on Japanese prints and later Buddhist art. You can see from this picture that this is um, an image from the house on 54th Street and this was um, a picture in, um, I believe, John's office. I unfortunately don't have a photo of her living spaces that show her Japanese prints, but I did want to um, quote you some um, details or uh, writings that she wrote to her sister Lucy where she describes putting up her Japanese prints. So I'm going to read what she wrote. Um, she writes to Lucy, I'm also rearranging the library. I've decided the trouble with the screen over the mantel is that it is too black. I want to find a gold screen about three or four feet high for the place. I've taken down all the Japanese prints and hung some of my paintings. In another letter to Lucy, she mentions redecorating her office in Maine. She writes, Ever since we have made the house over, I have wondered what to do with my little office room. I've just finished hanging my set of 14 Utamaro prints there, and it occurs to me that I could make this room very attractive if you would bring me back some Korean things. So based on the Utamaro prints that she mentioned, I've managed to track down um, this set of 14 in our collection. And I think that these are the prints that she is referring to. And um, I didn't have the space to put all 14, so I'm just showing you three here. But this is um, a set of prints depicting birds. They were originally part of a bound book entitled Myriad Birds, a Kyoka Competition. They're printed on fine paper and embellished with metallic pigments and fine embossing techniques. And the images of birds and flowers here are paired with Japanese poetry. As luxuriously printed books, they were highly sought after and played a big role in increasing the fame and reputation of the publisher and illustrator at the time. Here unbound, they were also much admired and appreciated by Abby Rockefeller. One can only imagine how her office must have looked with all 14 up on the wall. In the same letter to Lucy, where she writes about redecorating her office, she also wrote that she had invited over 100 people to tea to hear an illustrated lecture on Japanese prints. From these correspondences, we can see that she collected and used prints not just for decorating, but she considered them as objects of study as well. 
Abby was a shrewd collector with a discerning eye. Many prints that she bought, like this one, were extremely rare, with no known copies extant. She kept a record of what she owned. She was very careful about acquiring duplicates, and she paid close attention to prices of prints available on the art market. Unlike her sister Lucy, who went often to Asia, Abby, Abby only went to Asia once in 1921. She mainly bought from auction houses and art dealers in New York, especially those which, which she had long-standing and established relationships with. She did entreat her sister to buy her prints from Japan, and she always cautioned Abby against buying duplicates. When she went to Japan in 1921, she bought many prints herself. Um, I think she bought almost 60 that year alone from Japan. So why is Abby's collection special? To my knowledge, it is the largest single collection of prints of this subject outside Japan. It is distinct not just because of its size, but more importantly for its breadth and its depth. When the Rockefeller collection entered RISD in the 1930s, the study of Japanese prints as a serious art historical field was still relatively non-existent. It would not be until much later that this encyclopedic collection was recognized as an important source for understanding the development of Japanese printmaking. In its entirety, the collection represents a vast spectrum of woodblock printing technology. So we will see in the ensuing slides um, pictures from monochromatic prints to highly sophisticated multicolored block prints. And um, so in other words, Abby can definitely, I think, be considered a pioneer, someone ahead of her time in terms of thinking about the pedagogical potential of these prints. Because she focused primarily on this one subject, she built a collection that allowed for close comparison um, and study across formats, mediums, and methods. And I'll give you a few examples. Prints of different formats. So you can see here that this print is what we call a tanzaku, uh, which is a paper strip. It's long and vertical, and you see the birds and the moon juxtaposed with poem, with poetry. Sizes of prints like that, or strips like that, were very um, much used for writing poetry. And even today, the practice continues, and these poetry strips would then be attached to trees on a festival known as the Tanabata on the seventh day of the seventh month. You can see here in this even more slender print, this is what they call a pillar print. It would have been used to be a pasted on a pillar in one's home. If you've been to the RISD Museum, you might have seen this print, which is a fan print. So many print designers would make fan prints. You would cut them out, and you would attach it to a bamboo frame and use it as an accessory. So the theme of chrysanthemum and moon, for instance, would have been really suitable for the autumn season. And speaking of cutouts, this is really fun. These are little vignettes that you would have been able to cut out and put into interesting collages and assemblies yourself. So here you see that the, these prints came in multiple formats. They also came in monochrome. So in this print on the left, which mimics ancient Chinese stone rubbings, the artist has deliberately used only ink, right? And here you see um, the artist's um, use of an, just blue. The craze for Prussian blue or Berlin blue um, came about in Japan in the 1830s when this synthetic pigment became widely available and affordable for print. Before that, they were using vegetal ties that were very light, sensitive, and elusive. So you can see how excited they were when this color came in, and they utilized it to make different hues and tones. 
You also have specialized prints like that. Um, on the left is a print that was made with lacquer. On the right, a print that is privately commissioned, circulated only among um, a small poetry group, and embellished with metallic pigments. And this is really interesting because Abby didn't only collect prints. She collect sketches, preliminary sketches, and also proofs. So here you can see how she thinks about Japanese prints as a subject for study. And she wants to understand the process because when the illustrator makes a sketch, they then send it over to the woodblock carver who then carves away at it. The woodblock carver prints an initial proof like that and returns it to the artist, in this case, Hokusai, who adds his notes and edits. And then, with his edits, the final print um, gets printed. So you see from these examples how Abby also thought about the process, thought about how these prints could be used for study. So Abby gave her entire collection to the RISTI Museum in 1934. And, when she, and here you can see the bulletin of the Rhode Island School of Design in January 1935, devoted entirely to describing her rich collection. And a photograph that I found from the Providence Sunday Journal in 1935 which shows um, a room designed by the architect Philip Johnson um, installed just to display Abby's prints. And you can see how um, people are looking at the same prints that you see here in frames in that room. As the museum expanded, the room remained. And so in the, all the iterations of the, um, at the renovations and expansions at the museum, Philip Johnson's room was always reinstalled in some way or other. And, um, and this was a view in 1984. And this is the room you see today, if you've had a chance to visit. And we continue to show her prints. And we change our exhibitions every six months. So I hope you have had a chance to, to see the new installation. I wanted to end with saying that the range and diversity of Abby's print has inspired numerous exhibitions and scholarship. You can see that students continue to study the prints in the print room that we have at the museum. And they give presentations um, of her works. And they learn about Japanese culture and history in this way, in addition to artistic processes. So I hope that seeing some of the prints here today, and we had to breeze through quite a few because I don't have a lot of time, but I hope that it's inspired you as well and that you will come back and visit the museum and visit the print room when you are in Providence. So with that, I'd like to thank you with this um, little cute print of a book. And, um, and I'll, feel free to take questions after.